Geert, uh, if people read about you, they might get confused as to what s discipline uh, you are in. What kind of a bird are you? I, I have called myself in, in, in Dutch a schagelt professor, which is kind of professor at large, um, without necessarily attributing myself to any particular discipline. Right, so uh, you yourself don't make a big thing of the discipline that you're in? No, okay. I think that maybe uh, the, well, one of my particular uh, identities is not having one. You don't have an identity, but your contribution to science does have one. What is culture as you define it? Um, well, my definition is, of course, a particular definition, which is that uh, the uh, collective programming of the mind that distinguishes one group or category of people from another. Um, uh, but uh, that is one particular way of, 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 of defining and there are other definitions as well. So what is the um, peculiarity and uh, what makes your concept of culture so usable? Um, maybe that I focus on the way culture is acquired. It is, uh, I use the term programming of the mind, which of course is a metaphor because the mind isn't programmed like a computer is, but we all have computers so we all know what's meant by programming. But uh, what I focus on is uh, how do people acquire their programming and uh, I picture actually the human being as uh, somebody who comes in this world, let's say with an operating system, but uh, still needing a lot of programming in order to function. And uh, that is uh, one thing which people can understand. Uh, in my definition, you read the word collective. It's a collective programming, which means it is those things which are shared by people who grew up in the same forest. Um, you have told us that culture is the collective programming of the mind. Um, which is a bit of a difficult notion because it's both collective and it resides in individuals, in their minds. So how can you measure culture? Um, always on the basis of collective phenomena. So uh, you can look at people, how they behave, for example, in a particular environment, but you can also collect data from individuals, but then take a central tendency in those. Central tendency, which may mean take the average or take the percentage that of people that gives a certain answer. Uh, researchers often try to add to the body of knowledge about culture by doing a survey in a particular country. Would that be a feasible option? Um, well, in my case, uh, what my work is about is comparison. Mm -hmm. It's uh, actually measuring is always comparing. And I'm trying to measure culture by comparing similar uh, cultures, so one place from another. And I have compared nations and I've also compared organizations. What is the difference between comparing nations and comparing organizations? I can assume there's both a method, uh, methodological difference and a difference in the kind of results that you might get. Yes, yes. Well, the method methodological difference is, of course, that uh, uh, they're almost perpendicular to each other. Um, if you compare nations, you compare similar people, similar organizations, similar situations in different countries. And if uh, you study organization cultures, you're studying different organizations within the same country. Right. Um, so they're two different things and then uh, the results are quite different, uh, which actually is related to the question of how cultures are acquired. Because when do we acquire the culture of our nations? Well, from the moment onwards we are born in that nation. And uh, the learning the, we acquire in the first part of our life, which is before puberty, which is, say, before the, certainly in the first 10 years of our lives, 
that learning is uh, mostly unconscious. So national culture is composed of many unconscious elements. Now, when do we acquire organizational culture? So that is from the moment we join that organization. And uh, that is for most people after they have completed their education, when they are younger or not so young adults. Uh, which means that then uh, we, uh, there we acquire things that are completely conscious. The unconscious elements are in the national culture, the conscious elements are in the organization culture. Which also means that we get uh, completely different uh, problems. Um, you can uh, basically say you're in different disciplines, because national cultures are actually a topic for anthropology and organization cultures are a topic for organizational sociology. All right. Would you consider yourself an anthropologist then? Uh, no, uh, although I sometimes uh, have called myself an organizational anthropologist, hmm. which is a safe term because it's never been officially defined. <laughs> Now, you said that if you want to investigate national culture, you need to uh, look at the actions or questionnaire responses of similar people across countries. Uh, many surveys are based on a specific category of people, such as managers or teachers or students. Have you got something to say about the kind of sample that you need to investigate culture across nations? Um, well. Of course, the more diverse the sample, uh, the better, because you get a broader um, uh, picture of a particular society, but you must find similarly diverse samples in other societies. So mm -hmm. a an survey activity that does this is the World Value Survey, which uses representative samples of the population according to market research principles. Whether that's always safe, as whether it's always carried out in such a way that the samples are really matched, well, can be disputed. But anyway, it's probably the best we have. Other samples are what you could call narrow samples, like in my case, sampling people in the same kind of jobs in different uh, subsidiaries of the IBM Corporation. Um, it could be uh, students and preferably students of a particular discipline, for example, psychology students in various countries. It could be like uh, Professor Schwartz has done, is comparing elementary school teachers, which is a probably a very interesting group also, because they transfer their ideas also to children. Can you say something about what is a dimension of culture and how come uh, the number of dimensions in your model has changed? Well, a dimension of culture is a way of unpackaging the concept of culture. Uh, culture, of course, is just an imaginary thing. It is a product of our imagination, which is supposed to be useful to understand the world and to be able to predict certain things in society. Uh, but as long as culture is, let's say, um, a holistic concept, mm -hmm. uh, it is rather difficult to do, make any predictions because it, it uh, involves so much. Mm -hmm. So what the dimensions are, are ways of unpackaging this holistic concept of culture into particular parts which have man much clearer relationship to phenomena in society. And originally I found four. The fact that we find more and more is not surprising because more and more people are collecting data and they are reaching areas from which in the beginning we had no information. Right. So, uh, what is actually, would you say, the function of culture? To go back to the, uh, the total concept of culture. Why do human beings need culture? Um, it is the the glue that keeps societies together. Right. Um, you can also say it's automatic. The moment you have a society, you get a culture because there are particular 
relationships between the people who make up that society and they have to play their game according to certain rules. So it's the unwritten rules of the social game It's the unwritten group. rules of the social game, yes. Right. Yes. So you need culture in order to play the, the game of everyday social relationships in a, exactly. in a society. Yes. Right. And also in an organization. In an organization also, because in that case, uh, except that in that case, the rules are at a different level. They are much more pragmatic and much less uh, profound, I would say. They're more explicit also, and they are also changeable. Maybe it's a good time now to start to have a look at these dimensions in your work. Um, uh, could you tell us something first about how did you first discover uh, the importance of culture in the data that you collected at IBM? Because uh, if I am correct, this was just uh, personal research and not necessarily aimed at discovering cultural differences. No, it's true. Well, it was uh, input from several sides. And uh, one input was my own experience because I had an international job, I worked in the international staff, and I visited many different countries, especially European countries, also some Middle Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I was from time to time in uh, the United States. So, uh, and it was an American company, so there also you saw differences. So, you experienced these differences, and then also we collected, we started to collect data, asking the same questions about their work, to employees in different parts of the world. Um, that was something which came very uh, logically in the philosophy of the founders of IBM, because they had always said that the company has a responsibility towards its employees, so the um, opinion of the employees is very important. So we had, a, we had an entry there. Although we still had to convince local managers mm -hmm. to allow us to do those surveys and to have it done by their own people in their own language. But the aim of those surveys, those surveys was not to discover differences in culture. That it was not. It was not. It came out. Actually, uh, we saw after having done it for some time, and it was a, quite a large operation, we noticed that um, there were two things. There were, on the one hand, what we could call values, on the other hand, what we could call satisfactions. And they were not necessarily related. And that, um, especially on this area of values, you saw a pattern between countries. Satisfactions could vary. One group in a country could be satisfied, another group could not be satisfied. But um, if you ask, for example, on this dimension of power distance, um, uh, whether uh, people noticed, whether thought it was a problem that employees were afraid to disagree with their managers, mm -hmm. you notice that you got a rank order of countries in this respect. And you got that rank order regardless of whom you asked, regardless whether you ask research scientists or whether you ask um, uh, secretaries or whether you ask uh, rank and file workers. Okay, so you started to see that all people from a certain country would tend to respond the same to these questions about, for instance, fear of expressing an opinion. Yeah, at least there what was a component then? in there. there right. was a, they didn't all answer the same, but you could say that uh, if you compared country A to country B, there would always be more people in country A who get a particular opinion than in country B. Right, so what was your next step when you found that? Uh, trying to interpret it, and then, uh, and then you should also realize that the time in history played a role. Um, the first uh, survey was held around 1968. Mm -hmm. And 1968 was a year that there was a lot of upheaval, especially in Europe, about power. Yes. About power and self-determination and so. So the uh, Questionnaires we had at the time contained were made by people who were children of their times, of course. So they contained quite a few questions about power. 
And when we analyzed that, we discovered that there were differences in answers about power. This, in fact, was the first dimension that came out. Can you tell us something about how you discovered, established and named that first dimension? Um, that was at the time there was a popular book by a Dutch social psychologist, Paul Mulder, um, and it also appeared in English, it was called The Daily Power Game, and he coined the word power distance as the uh, relationship, the emotional relationship between the person at the top and the person below her or him, him at the time, I would say. Yeah. Um, can you define that dimension more formally and maybe give an example of uh, how you could recognize power distance in uh, the daily life? Yeah, um, well, the definition is that you say it's the emotional distance between uh, a person on a higher step and a lower step. It's like like hierarchy. feeling like a child uh, and parents? Maybe like a child the relationship. You find it in the relationship between the child and the parent, in the relationship between a teacher and a pupil, in the relationship between the boss and the subordinates, in the relationship between the government and the citizen. In all those places you have power So, distance. for instance, obedience uh, between parents and children would carry over would into carry work over relationships? Would carry over into those other parts of society, yes. Right. Yes, it would. Hmm. Okay, uh, an example. And let me try to give an example from my own experience, because mm -hmm. that is always, uh, it is always the, the, the most, well, the most impressive. It's not, it's not something just taken from a standard story. It is my own experience. It's a few years ago that I was invited to give a lecture at a university in northeastern France, near the German border. And this university had not only invited their own staff and students, but also some staff and students from a nearby German university. And after I'd given my lecture, we had a discussion session, and it was noticeable that among the Germans, it was the students who asked the questions, among the French, it was only the professors who asked the questions. Now, in my measurement, the power distance for France is considerably larger than the power distance is for Germany. But what I did notice is that when afterwards we had a drink at a uh, nearby cafe, and the professors were not present, that some of the students came to me and asked me their questions. Out of the outside the presence of the professors. Mm. Now mm. on that same trip, the next day, um, I still had a talk with the uh, colleague who invited me, and the colleague said, um, "You were. Uh, we thank you for having been so kind to our students." And I was. You mean the French students? to his students, to mm. his friend, to have him be so kind mm. to his students. He was a French professor. Mm. And, uh, well, I didn't feel I had been particularly kind. I had just been myself. But I concluded that my behavior as a Dutch professor comes across as kind in comparison to the behavior of the average French professor towards right. his students. Can you say something about the culture dimension of individualism versus collectivism? Uh, again, a personal experience. And uh, yes, um, there is a difference in individualist collectivism between the Netherlands, my own country, we are supposed to be quite individualist, and uh, the uh, former Dutch colony of Indonesia, uh, which is typically a combination of various collectivist societies. Now, um, I became very much aware of this when uh, one of uh, Retian's brothers um, married a uh, Chinese Indonesian Dutch wife. And uh, by uh, him marrying into that family, uh, we plot suddenly were also had also become members of that family because in the collectivist background which this family which came originally from Indonesia has retained 
the concept of family is much larger. So now we belong to that family, which is very nice. And I also remember that uh, one day we were invited at the party. Uh, my daughter-in-law's mother turned 75 and she had a party in a restaurant and there were about 80 guests. And at that time I was just um, planning for a party of our own. And I asked her, now, if you have to be 80 guests, how many invitations do you have to send? And I expected she would say about 100. She said, well, about 60. <laughs> and of course, they bring their friends. If you belong to that situation, you bring your friends who also belong. The third dimension that you defined is also very much about relationships between people, isn't it? You mean masculinity versus femininity? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Well, uh, it is related actually to uh, the fact that uh, genders in different societies are, uh, say, acquiring different mental programs. And um, if what I call a masculine society is a society where there is a kind of a division of values, where men are supposed to be tough and practical and hard, and uh, women are supposed to be uh, gen uh, tender and uh, concerned with the uh, quality of life. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Okay. And a, uh, Isn't that true then? Uh, well, to some extent, uh, you could find this element in all societies, but uh, much more in some societies than in other. Basically, what I call a feminine society is a society where both men and women are from Venus. Societies where both come from Mars are not stable, I think. They would, they would fall apart. And do you have experiences in your personal life with masculinity and uh, femininity? Well, let me give you one example. Um, masculinity and femininity is one of the dimensions where uh, uh, the difference between my country, the Netherlands, and the United States is strongest. USA is a pronouncedly masculine culture. And uh, in my measurements, the Netherlands is one of the most feminine countries in the world. Exactly, uh, only uh, Denmark, oh no, sorry, only Sweden and Norway score uh, lower still in, uh, lower in masculinity, higher in femininity. So uh, one of the uh, uh, examples I can men uh, mention is that when uh, my wife and I were traveling in the USA, and we were in Miami, Florida, and uh, we make a boat trip along the river, and uh, the guide told us from every beautiful house that was standing there how much it had cost. And that struck us because if you would sail, for example, the uh, Vecht River in the Netherlands, and you would sail along those beautiful houses, nobody would ever tell you what it had cost. We couldn't care less. This is not what we are interested in if we see something. No, maybe you would mention the architect or so, yes. or the family yeah. who built it. Yeah. But I have a similar example. Uh, another country that is much more masculine than Holland is Germany. This is more probably one of the most striking differences between German culture and Dutch culture. And we live close to the German border. And uh, my wife, Maike, is a member of a gardener's club and they go and visit gardens in various places and uh, to get inspiration. And because we're close to the border, they also went across the border to see a German garden. And at the end of the visit of the Dutch Gardeners Club, the owner of the garden, the lady, said, now this is interesting. When I have German guests here, they always want to know what it all costs. And you never ask me this question. Hmm. Let's go on. Mm. Um, and uh, we've now talked about three dimensions about human relationships. Um, there is another dimension uh, that is more about uh, fear and anxiety uh, rather than relationships mm -hmm. uh, that you found 
also in the first IBM study. Mm -hmm. uh, uncertainty avoidance is the name that you gave to that dimension. Yes. And uh, does it have to do with risk avoidance or uh, with anxiety? What is the nature of this dimension? Um, it has to do, I think, with handling ambiguity. Handling situations you don't know what they are about and you want to know what the situation is about. And uh, therefore, uh, uncertainty avoiding societies tend to have many rules. It doesn't mean that they always respect the rules, but they have a feeling there should be many rules. Uh, but I remember that you also wrote about uh, speed at uh, speed on motorways being yes. related to this dimension. Yes. How is that a rule? I mean, uh, whether the so maximum speed the is 180 yeah. Yeah. or 120 or 100, in each case it's a rule, isn't That's it? So much, not so much the rule, but uncertainty avoidance is a complex dimension. It's basically related to stress. It's to stress anxiety and uh, stress societies tend to want to drive faster. So speeds and, and also the tolerated speeds, because there is a pressure in a stressed society to tolerate higher speeds, which you see happening in our country at the present time. Okay, so there is a relationship apparently in this one dimension between the two phenomena of stress and yeah. ambiguity. Stress and ambiguity. And if people cannot tolerate ambiguity, they are most, the society is more stressed. Then uh, later, in a different study, you found a fifth dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, and you found that in China, if I'm correct. Uh, can yeah. you say something about the, uh, why you found it there and why you found it later and what that dimension means? Yeah, actually it came out of a research by a colleague of mine, uh, Michael Bond. And the story is that uh, uh, when I had found my first four dimensions, uh, Michael Bond had done a study in East Asia of a number of countries, and uh, he had analyzed his data in a different way, but when he used my way of analyzing, he found the same four dimensions in his data. Now this was of course very exciting, so we wrote an article about it together, but we were also philosophizing on it and said, well, uh, let's apply this thinking to ourselves. Uh, could it have something to do with the fact that we both are from Western countries, uh, Bond is a Canadian, and that uh, maybe because we have Western minds, this is why we get those four dimensions. And if people had had a different kind of mind, let's say an Eastern mind, would they have found the same dimensions? To what extent is what you find a product of what you have in your mind as a researcher? Well, it probably depends on the questions that you ask in the survey. Exactly, about yeah. the questions you ask. So, and because Bond was a professor in Hong Kong, and he had many Chinese colleagues, he asked his Chinese colleagues to make his questionnaire. So we got questions which were traditional in Chinese thinking. And we used that questionnaire in, well, Bond used it, and I collaborated, but he used it in 23 countries around the world and we looked at dimensions and we found one dimension we hadn't found before. We found another one not in there because it was Western way of thinking which was uncertainty avoidance but we found a dimension <coughs> which I called long-term versus short-term orientation and it was a dimension on which the East Asia which was long-term opposed most of the Western countries, which were shorter term, and it was an explanation also of the East Asian economic miracle, because longer term cultures grew faster. Uh, later on, uh, research by our friend uh, Michael Minkoff, Michaud, um, showed that this short term side was actually related to something which he called monumentalism, which is the idea that uh, people should be uh, should have principles uh, and uh, should have traditions and they should be proud and uh, they should not deviate from that so there would be on the short term there would be pride and tradition 
and on the long term there would be adaptability and the eye on the future. And that turned out to be a very meaningful dimension. Uh, Professor Hofstede, these are good times for students of culture. There are many data available on the web, such as your own data or the data of the World Values Survey. There are many universities in many countries where young people are studying culture. Uh, would you have any piece of advice to these people? Um, I would be very happy seeing, I'm mean, always very happy, you're seeing applications. You're seeing uh, people who have related phenomena in the real world to those dimensions. And uh, so that is what I would recommend. I would recommend uh, practical research where you show uh, to what extent differences in culture explain differences in phenomena in the real world. What did you think will be the future of uh, the uh, pattern of cultures across the world? What with the World Wide Web mm. and with uh, globalization, uh, are we going to see a further fading away of cultural differences? Well, uh, you must make a difference here between uh, practices and values. I think there will be a harmonization of practices simply because we all use this World Wide Web and you need some practices to use it. But what you feel doing it and what you value doing it will differ. And there is this amount of information is so huge that within that system there is room for all kinds of values. So no uh, single worldwide culture uh, no. in uh, the near future no as far as No single worldwide concerned. culture. And if you doubt that, try to tell me how that single worldwide culture should look. Should it look like Russian culture? Should it look like Chinese culture? Should it look like Brazilian culture? Should it look like American culture? Should it look like... Of course it should look like Dutch culture. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>